Hello everybody, welcome to um, the webinar number four, the second webinar of our second module on uh, the FAIR data principles. My name is Liz Stokes, uh, I'm from the ARDC skills team and I'm going to talk to you about ex um, what the FAIR data principles have to say beyond protocols and into what uh, repositories can do um, to make uh, research data accessible to their users. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which um, I'm standing today, which is um, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, these, uh, sovereignty has not been ceded uh, to these people and I pay my respects to the traditional owners both past and present, and welcome any First Nations people who are joining us today. So let's get straight into it. Uh, so a um, little bit of um, front matter, perhaps, um, maybe I'll call it. There's a link down the bottom there to the Code of Conduct. Um, uh, please have a read of that and let us know if you have any issues. Um, you are more than welcome to put questions or comments in the chat um, modules in um, go to um, go to webinar here today as I'm talking, um, but I won't respond really to them uh, until the end question and answer time. But if it um, if you word it such that it is urgent, then um, one of my um, awesome ARDC team will no doubt respond promptly. So, um, and of course, I encourage you to take on any thoughts that you have and share them in our Slack channel um, this afternoon after this webinar. Okay, oh, I accidentally moved on. Great, well, let's keep going then. Um, so. The overview for today is that we will, um, uh, I'm going to um, look at um, recapping over repositories role in enabling FAIR data, um, look at some examples about how different um, uh, repositories mediate um, open and closed access to data, and then we'll have a little Q&A session and um, finish up with a um, any questions you might have around the activities, quiz and community discussions um, for this coming module, okay? Um, right here. Okay, so the FAIR principle that I'm going to be covering today um, is really um, this, this one, this A2 metadata, that metadata are accessible even when the data are no longer available. This is um, actually, the principle for this uh, is really the backstop for repositories, our data repositories that we um, know and love. It, it cycles back to the undertaking of the other principles under findable, interoperable and reusable that repositories do. Um, but today I'm going to be concentrating on access to data via those repositories. So, um, I would like to put a little disambiguation here, okay, in that um, for the FAIR principles, accessible means access to the data. It's not necessarily about the web content accessibility guidelines, although that is certainly um, part of best practice in facilitating access to anything on the internet. Um, but it's really more about who can access what data under what conditions. And as every um, uh, repository and their use cases can be quite different from each other. There is no one standard to um, manage all of this. Okay, well, let's get into some practical, answering some practical questions. So what can repositories do to do to enable FAIR data? So you recall I shared a few um, examples. Looks like the slide's not working. That's interesting. So. Um, you, you'll recall, as I was, uh, that um, a few repositories that I shared, for example, uh, Zenodo and um, the Australian Data Archive, uh, which featured um, a, a nice little introduction in our Slack channel last week. Thank you, Mar um, thank you to Marina. Um, 
I think we'll, I guess we'll just wait for that slide to keep on loading or I might move forward um, into that. Um, often, often we are, um, when we're looking uh, at what repositories can do to enable FAIR data, um, we're often looking for examples of best practice and what are the exemplary data repositories out there. So one um, reason why I chose some of those repositories, such as the Australian Data Archive and uh, the, um, uh, the ICPSR, the Social Science Data Archive, um, hosted by the University of Michigan, um, are that both of those uh, repositories are benchmarked, have um, gone through a certification process for the core trust seal. So this idea of benchmarking against trusted data repository requirements is um, certainly one um, reason that uh, uh, you, you, might, um, you might go into enabling FAIR data by pursuing that certification process. It's, um, uh, it's not necessarily easy um, and it certainly takes um, a certain amount of time, um, but my colleagues at ARDC have assisted a few people in um, going there. I think, um, so as I was saying, um, I was going to mention benchmarking against the trusted data repository requirements. Um, hey, it's working now. Great. Okay. Um, I've included a link down there to the core trust seal. Um, you can, I encourage you to follow that link um, and have a look around because it's a nice little map which takes you to actually the physical address that's been look, um, that's been registered against each repository. Um, and it's a nice way of understanding Australian repositories and, and where they're based. Um, but okay, I'm just gonna gonna leave that there. Not go deep into that um, certification process. So another thing that um, uh, repositories can do. Um, in order to facilitate access is to implement a mechanism for authorization and authentication. Now, ah, two multisyllabic words starting with A. What does this really mean? So, for example, on two slide 11, um, is the ALA, the Atlas of Living Australia. Okay, as you can see here in this slide, they have provided a range of different ways that you can uh, what rays of different ways for authentication. So to authenticate as a user, you can either sign in with the Australian Access Federation, you can choose, or you can choose more um, uh, uh, social media and corporate type accounts with Google, Facebook and Twitter there, or you can create your own account. So they also provide a way of uh, a username and password account there. But the point I'm making is that this is all for facilitating the authentication, which is what the machines take care of in terms of our um, fair data principles, humans and machines um, working on the same data together. For authorization, on the other hand, this is something for uh, humans to decide. So I'm gonna come back to um, a later discussion of mediating uh, data in that way. Um, Another thing that repositories can do is to expose the data and metadata with a well-documented API. Um, who remembers what API stands for from Matthias's lecture um, in the, on Monday? Um, I welcome your answers in the chat there. I'm going to show you an example um, from the CSIRO data access portal. This is a screen share, but um, if you take your um, cursor up to the top uh, right hand corner where it says API next to help there, um, you'll see some pretty splendid um, and thorough documentation on how the API works and how you might um, uh, how you might get ac automated access to the data um, that CSIRO provides. Okay, so um, so this is really where I um, I wanted to start talking about these different um, methods of uh, facilitating access to data. And um, as I mentioned before, a lot of this comes down to what people um, need to consider in terms of 
uh, understanding the needs of their researchers and the researchers um, uh, and the people providing access to that data. So, for example, um, mediation, okay, is really all about uh, respecting the wishes of the data generators and content owners or um, people who are responsible for providing that data. Um, but it's also about navigating any legal frameworks that we might operate in, which, which um, sometimes tend to value the individual's right over um, rights over their intellectual property, right? Um, and of course, there are different cases where um, uh, a researcher or certainly a repository manager may wish to provide more or higher security um, to data and to restrict access to it. But um, the people who had given their data or provided that um, may want more um, uh, more openness about that data. So uh, we could we could go um, we could go to an oral history example um, where the people sharing um, sharing data for perhaps a, a co certain community um, they may actually want to be named um, even if they are discussing discussing something that is quite private. Okay. So um, the mediation that occurs between the repository managers and the um, and the researchers and the people providing that is well, how many people is okay for us to share this data with? Okay. Uh, another example, on the other hand, might be uh, thinking about uh, medical data and access to that. So people might never actually want to be necessarily identified but they may be very happy for that information to go out wide and be shared with uh, relevant researchers and other research groups to progress um, advances in medicine and um, combating things like a pandemic, for example. Um, so, um, and I suppose it's also an interesting point to note just um, thinking back to uh, how ALA provides access through social media platforms, so not necessarily only through the AAF, but social media as a as a thing that has happened, I do apologise for my incoherence right now, um, the way that social media platforms restrict and enable information to go to people in your network and to advertisers is also actually an example of mediation, um, one that perhaps we have already um, signed onto in theory, if not necessarily um, uh, having having read all the details of the um, uh, of that thing that you need to read to sign that you accept and agree um, those terms and conditions. But I'm moving away now into um, uh, analogy territory. So I'll just pull it back a little, coming back. So um, for example, another con concern that people might have is that um, the data not, might not necessarily be digital as well. So it's, um, I suppose, many of the researchers on, on board here um, might be familiar with needing to organise paper forms for having a discussion with their research participants uh, about consent for collecting the data and what might happen or what might be done with that data after they have collected it. Okay, so um, and this negotiation um, over access to long term consent, um, it's not uncommon to be in paper and and certainly that's something to take into account for repository managers who may be concentrating largely on having a, um, a repository that is for digital objects only. So um, it's there. there's potential to um, branch out into um, physical uh, holdings as well. Um, we could also um, look at commercially sensitive data um, and 
um, where decisions need to happen in terms of controlling the bounds of who might access that data. So this kind of mediation might happen via legal instruments or providing a memorandum of understanding between different partners. So it's really all about um, ensuring that there is clarity for what the mechanism is to in, enter into negotiations for how to access that data. Or for example, if we're talking in the commercial sector, we might actually be talking um, about um, data science initiatives. So um, that includes, uh, sorry, that was my daughter. Um, so that includes um, access to perhaps the software um, and any code or algorithms or pipelines and workflows. Ah, awesome, finish that sentence. And of course, um, so maybe the um, collaborative research centres where um, a university department or FAFI might have organised, um, uh, have a partnership with a commercial organising that. So they might have federated, federated agreements to share their data. So these are only a few examples of that, but some of those, um, um, as you can appreciate, some of that data might need to always be closed. And it's, a, it's really about having that clarity um, about what data or rather what metadata is available um, so, so that people um, have, have a record of that. Okay. So, so deciding on, on the access can be, um, so that was all sort of pretty heavy, actually, I'd like to say. Um, and there are, there's, you know, it's a veritable minefield um, when you're talking about access to sensitive data and um, what you can enable to be open or closed. Hang on a moment. Um, I just need to be talking right now. Thank you. Um, so, I wanted to highlight um, the Coalition of Publishing in the Earth, Space and Environmental Sciences, which is what the COPDES acronym in that slide is, um, how they decided to publish an agreement uh, in 2014 um, about what they would do in order to facilitate the FAIR data principles. Okay, so on to slide 17. Um, so part of that um, is a um, so they um, wrote a commitment statement and they encouraged um, individuals and uh, institutions and all kinds of organisations to um, sign on as signatories to this commitment statement. So among those signatories, there are researchers, publishers, societies, institutes, infrastructure providers and repositories as well all coming together as a community to implement these principles. Um, and of course, if you're in the earth and space sciences, you could sign on to this too. So I'll just put that out there um, in case you were looking for something to do after the webinar. Okay, so now it's time for me to move on to the um, this um, final. Okay, let's get back to the metadata. Okay. Um, so Meta, making the metadata available even when the data are no longer available. So what does this mean? Well, curating metadata indefinitely, which is um, ultimately what I suppose we're expecting our data repositories to do, requires quite a lot of effort. So, um, so it's actually quite important um, for us to consider the, the end goal or um, what might happen if, um, for example, the metadata are to be moved, okay? Maybe your repository is changing platforms or infrastructure, so you need to migrate uh, your metadata and your data and make sure they stay together. Um, or perhaps the project closes for which the repository has been um, created, or it could be, I, I don't know, like maybe even um, universities that have been around for centuries, but they, they may need to close. So, um, uh, so developing an exit strategy for how the metadata will be available, even if the data needs to be moved, um, is an important thing. So moving on to other reasons why the data would no longer be available, um, is that um, 
other file formats or standards may actually change. Okay, um, these examples that I have up on this slide um, are all kind of likely activities um, or things that could that may happen. So the published data itself may be have been withdrawn or retracted. Um, the creators um, might have moved on. They may have changed institutions, for example, or the re research project ah was a giant con, for example, or rather it closed. Um, sorry, I don't mean to cast aspersions on um, our research community. So the research project concludes. Uh, or, for example, maybe this um, this has happened to you, the government or other department changes its name. So then it's very hard to find that data where you thought it was in the labyrinthine structure of their website. So how does it help to have the metadata available? So um, moving on from like all of the problems, things that could go wrong, um, here are a few examples of where it would be good to have access to that metadata. So it enables you to have contextual information to follow up. Um, if uh, you um, want to get in touch with the original data creators, you may want to um, find out what else this uh, research data was related to. So other, other related research outputs and to support meta analysis uh, and citation so that um, uh, we don't necessarily want to break the citation um, chain. So um, especially if the data perhaps was retracted, at least you can look up the citation to that and you have, a, uh, have, you, you have some kind of provenance trail um, for the work that went into that. Um, uh, and indeed, when I, when I say that meta-analysis is not really a pun, um, I know I love that and that helps me understand it, but um, having metadata available can enable um, that distant reading uh, by doing analysis on the metadata that is available for um, a certain discipline, subject or field, um, but also um, doing meta-analysis, which is the field that I personally really only have a cursory understanding of, although I uh, appreciate that um, meta-analyses are an excellent uh, field of research, uh, methodology, I should probably say. I have a librarian background um, and can gloss over things. Moving right along. Okay. So if you would like to take access conditions further, um, I would encourage you to join um, the Sensitive Data Community of Practice, uh, which is actually um, convened um, and looked after by our um, colleague Nicola Burton. Um, and we'll put these um, links in the Slack chat. Um, you can also continue to the, the discussion around access. Um, maybe you have some examples that you would like or thorny issues of um, uh, moderating or mediating access to research data that you would like to discuss with your fellow participants. Um, and also there's a link to the um, resources on the ARDC website. So we have things for managing sensitive data. There's a guide for publishing sensitive data and a flowchart for sharing sensitive data. So in summary, um, these um, these are those the four um, fair data principles um, that we have covered in our um, accessible module. And ultimately, like to wrap all of this up, um, considering the access uh, metadata, access to metadata as well as data uh, into the long term, um, the idea is that it should be archived long term and made available in such a way that it can be easily retrieved by humans and machines or be used locally with the help of standard communication protocols. So now I guess it's time for a Q&A. Um, I'll give you a few moments to um, ask some questions. Okay, 
Um, okay, so we do have some questions. Um, oh, and a lot of people did uh, answer correctly what API stands for, Applications Programming Interface. Good memory, guys. Um, okay, now, uh, oh, and also uh, some people commiserating with the intrusion by your daughter. Uh, for example, one person saying that their 18 month old is now all up to speed on fair data principles. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, and so um, we do actually do have a question. Uh, can you think of an example of a closed repository? Oh, um, uh, I... ICO? <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so um, I, can't, I, can't, I personally can't necessarily think of any uh, repositories that are fully closed because, well, I've not seen them. But there certainly are a number of repositories that that have closed data stored, uh, and you can't get access to that data. Uh, and I'm pretty sure, although I might have to be corrected here, that the ADA Australian Data Archive is one of those. It does have open data sets, but it also does have closed data sets that are stored for archiving uh, and can't necessarily be accessed by anybody else. Um, Okay, uh, a procedural question. Oh, sorry, Liz, did you have more on that? Uh, I was just going to say that um, other, and like another example of closed data, perhaps. Um, I, I guess do you do you mean fully closed forever, or do you mean closed until um, un, until somebody asks for it? And and I ask this um, thinking about. Um, medical data collections, um, uh, perhaps thinking about um, uh, and um, government um, departments. So um, the collection of mortality and morbidity data across hospitals, which is um, collected and curated by um, uh, data custodians, um, jurisdictional data custodians across, usually organised in across the states and territories. Right, so there are there are processes for applying to access that data, and those um, are generally governed by advisory boards and uh, other uh, ethics clearance. Um, but I so that's that's kind of my model for data that is that is normally closed but can be opened up on. Um, uh, where where it's appropriate if it falls under a um, a research project. Uh, and in fact, there have been a lot of comments on this popping in while we've been speaking. Um, so, for example, uh, somebody has shared that uh, the Australian Geospatial Intelligence Organisation has a fully closed spatial data uh, repository, uh, and given geospatial intelligence, I'm not entirely surprised by that. And we do have a clarifying note from uh, from the from a representative of the ADA. Um, they would store part of the data as closed where it maintains the complete record of the project, but generally they would only accept data where at least part uh, is intended for sharing, whether that is mediated or open. So I think that actually brings up uh, an interesting discussion point in and of itself where from a project, some of the data can be made open, some of the data is mediated, but some will always remain closed. Um, and I suspect, in fact, the, for a piece of data that will always remain closed, uh, from my personal experience, is uh, say the the names of participants in an anonymous research. Sorry, in after the data has been anonymized, you still need to keep a list of the participants. Um, but you can't share that list, but you could share the anonymized data. Um, now, uh, uh, another question, nothing to do with accessibility. Matthias, has your beard grown since the last session? It has grown. I haven't cut my beard for quite some time. Same with my hair. Uh, look, isolation life, really. Um, who has time to go to the hairdresser? Um, but other than that, we have no more questions. Um, but certainly more compliments about uh, how we've been able to do so well despite the work from home situation. 
Um, so I think we should probably leave it there, Liz. Did you have anything more to add? In fact, sorry, you have more slides. Let's keep going through them. Oh, do I? Um, no. Oh, yes, it's the feedback slide. Thanks. So um, don't forget to share your feedback from today's um, webinar. Often I don't um, think of the question I really want to ask until at least two and a half minutes after the speaker has finished and packed up. Um, and I look forward to your discussions on the Slack and um, chatting away next week. So thanks, everybody.